a massive blow off top, a pullback in equities, and the Fed promising to make all of our dreams come true. This is Breaking Bitcoin. Welcome back to Breaking Bitcoin. We are live every day at 12 p.m. Central Standard Time. This is your daily source for everything markets, cryptocurrency, and finance. I'm your host, Justin Wise, lead analyst at CrackingCryptocurrency.com. Hopefully, you guys are doing absolutely fantastic. We have an incredible show for you guys today. So much to talk about. The markets have never been more crazy, never been more exciting. It's a fantastic day to be alive. Before we begin, of course, there's never been a better time to join our community and start building your own trading system, seeing movements like the ones that we just saw, whether you're on the right or the wrong side of them, improving and sharpening your skills is always the best thing to do. You can take advantage all of our proprietary indicators like minks and time transformation, our community mentoring, our premium trading signals, our automated strategies, and our suite of educational material and courses. There is a link down in the description that you can click for more information or point your browsers to premium.crackingcryptocurrency.com. Looks even better on mobile. That's premium.crackingcryptocurrency.com. So obviously today, as I said, so much that I want to cover, but we are currently experiencing a pullback. Now, uh, if we can hold support at 8,700 here, I think we can push for the 9,000s again intraday. And that was a beautiful blow off top. It's possibly just continue to cool off with a nice healthy retracement. Of course, we are tracking equities really closely with traditional markets experiencing another market wide pullback. Following the FOMC meeting yesterday, we can see Bitcoin continuing to essentially track the S&P index with higher volatility. Now, oddly enough, after that, that some very positive news actually came out uh, yesterday and today. Florida, Texas, Colorado, a few other states loosening their shoulders their social distancing restrictions and actually allowing businesses to reopen. Uh, Boris Johnson over in the United Kingdom saying that we are past the peak of the epidemic, at least uh, in the Eurozone, at least in the UK particularly. Uh, the worst news, though, of course, is the reaction from yesterday's uh, FOMC meeting, where Jerome Powell was pretty dovish. I mean, really, really dovish, in my opinion. Their main goal, of course, uh, throughout all of this is to exhibit confidence in the face of the crisis, right? They want to restore investor confidence. They want consumers and investors to know that, you know, they've got us. However, what they agreed to was to promise to do anything to prop up the economy, which, I mean, really, this is just, there, there, there was no difference from what's, what's happened. Nothing you know, transcendent came out yesterday. You know, regardless of all their talk about keeping credit swap lines open and keeping rates the same, uh, you know, they essentially agreed to continue to print money to prop up the economy, which resulted in a drop to the Dixie, a drop to investor confidence because they are seeing this this inflationary and deflationary fears and worries. Of course, the ideas of inflation are really drawn out. Those take years to develop, I think, honestly, uh, with all of the debt that's being destroyed. This is something that... Um, it's something, again, uh, that Ansel talked about lately in, in, in some of the podcasts that he's been in about how all of this debt being destroyed by defaults is actually potentially causing deflation. So potentially that we're working or looking in the wrong place for what we're concerned about with the economy. But uh, we've got a lot of market news to cover um, overall. Uh, overall, again, the last few days was incredibly exciting. Uh, it doesn't actually seem, I mean, despite the massive doji on today's candle, if we just look at overall market structure on the daily, this does look uh, like it is shaping up to be a swing high, right? So a couple of down days on the right side of this are going to be interesting, but we've seen this kind of leg up, leg down development, even with this volatility, uh, at least in traditional equities, right? And we can look you know, the question is, do we look at Bitcoin as a leading indicator for what the SPY will do? Or do we look at SPY as a leading indicator of what Bitcoin will do, right? Um, and honestly, I think that the second is more germane. So as we have not seen a massive reversal in the SPY, as we have not seen a massive reversal in equities, I think it's as entirely logical that we do continue to push up. Now, having said that, I do feel quite justified in what I said yesterday, right? Yesterday when the show was closing, I expected price to continue to push up and we did. Not quite to 10,000, but to 9,400. So we did continue to glide right to the upside and now we find ourselves having a pretty significant pullback, having coming coming having come back down basically today to where we ended up closing yesterday, right? On an inverted hammer candle, a fairly long doji, actually quite a long doji, right? So again, these are the things that can begin to look like a blow off top. 
We are overbought on minks. Traditional indicators are not really indicating that we are in an overextended area, and we've had this nice little long step up. So we have built a lot of shelves of support below us. There's been a lot of excited buying into Bitcoin, and we cannot discard the narrative that you have tons, and we can see this information coming in from the desks, right? For example, the desks are saying that they are still seeing increased sell flow on the BTC side from large funds because they are responding and hedging their long-term positions against what's going on in traditional equities and commodities. Commodities. However, in the term of cryptocurrency, they're seeing increased, you know, uh, dramatically increased buy side demand from uh, from individual investors. Right. And what this is saying is that individuals are flocking to cryptocurrency to gold. And this is happening in gold as well. You know, there is not enough gold circuit. You know, I don't want to say circulating, but there is not enough readily available gold uh, to meet the demand for physically delivered gold. Right. Uh, precious metals are in such high demand right now. As one of our members challenged investor pointed out, there is such a high demand for pre for physical precious metals right now that demand cannot actually be met with physical delivery, right? You're already waiting a week or so under normal conditions to actually take physical ownership to actually have it in your hand if you order physical precious metals. And now that process is taking two weeks to, to a month longer in some cases. Uh, in some cases, it's kind of like trying to order something from China, right? If you're here in the Americas where they're like, hey, you order it now. And you've heard of the slow boat from China. This is like the tugboat from China, right? So you order it now, you pay us, and, you know, send your raven out once a month to scope for the horizon to see if your package is coming in, right? Anybody that's tried to order cheap electronics from, from over there. But having said that, having said that, uh, overall, I think that things are looking very good. Overall, the economics of Bitcoin are looking very good. Of course, we've got the pre happening You know, do we start to see, is this the blow off top? And now we do see a 30 to 40% pullback prior to the happening, And then we can kind of kick things off again. Uh, I think that's less likely. I think, again, we've had a nice hash ribbons buy signal. So the idea of minor capitulation has ended. And, um, you know, we've we've got the the happening coming up. The one, I mean, obviously, the, the thing that I'm concerned about is post happening I see the likelihood of a pullback being more likely in post happening as we kind of shift shake out the miners that are going to be unprofitable because, you know, you have this idea that the system is perfect and that these miners and all of these mining farms have already done the calculations and everything's priced in. And it's really not. You guys, anybody who's lived normal life, who's ever just done a normal thing, knows that it's not like that. Things aren't very efficient. People don't. People generally aren't very, uh, don't have a lot of forethought. So, you know, people just kind of patch it up and just keep on going, right? Until they're forced to deal with the problem. And then when they're forced to deal with the problem in the event of a miner, in the case of the Bitcoin happening, and they see their profitability reduced by 50% without a subsequent 50% increase in price, which is unlikely to happen overnight, uh, you're going to have these issues. You're going to have these issues of miners shutting down. It's it, it's going to be inevitable, right? Everybody thinks that, uh, you know, for example, I just wanted to spell that illusion, right? That all the miners that know they're going to be profitable post the having have already figured it out and factored everything. They haven't, right? Some of them have. Sure. Some of the most responsible ones have, right? Just as in real life, you have highly responsible people that are on top of their, that are on top of their life and take precautions that are necessary and plan for the future and have their bills set aside and have their budgeting and do everything that they're supposed to do. And they experience increased success in life. And then you have generally the rest of the human population that, you know, <laughs> I don't want to talk about that right now. I don't want to deal with that right now. Uh, just trying to get by, my friend. Just doing the best that I can. Slapping band-aids all over these projects just so I can eke by another day and not have to call home to mom and get that rent check sent over, if you know what I'm saying. Um, so that, I think, unfortunately, that is more that is more uh, kind of the rest of the world. In fact, that we see that same you know modeling. We see that same modeling being set down by our institutions, by our central banks, by our governments who don't actually stop to develop with systems thinking philosophy or approach a sustainable system that makes sense, that is rational to tweak and develop. You know, they have this bolted on patched together framework built on a loose confederation of concepts and underlying philosophy that is very hard to make. It's very, it's very hard to to fix it fundamentally, right? It's very, you know, the all, you know, they just bolt on patches and fixes and slap band-aids on. That's exactly what the Fed is doing by stemming the money flow. That's exactly what our overall economy is doing with the way that we've structured things. And that's very unfortunate. And unfortunately, it, I'd like to say that a huge reset will make us think of things more sustainably. But, you know, as long as human beings have 
low time preferences. And as long as human beings with low time preferences are put into positions of making fundamentally important decisions for the rest of society, we are going to experience these errors. This is not a fault of any individual monetary system. This is not a fault of any individual person. This is not a fault of any individual economic decision or economic policy. This is a failure of low time preferences over high time preferences because high time preferences and sound money, sound money is what comes from a high time preference, right? A high time preference, by the way, means that you are thinking for the long term and a short time preference means that you are thinking for today. You are thinking of how to just get by and that's how most human beings are wired to operate because that's how our society is operated, uh, wired to operate. Just in time delivery systems, barely squeaking by, living paycheck to paycheck. These things are more common and more and more common nowadays than they used to be in the past because we have incentivized, and you can see this in our popular media, in our social media, you know, in our dating, you know, we we incentivize short time preferences and what is glossy and glamorous and attractive and sexy right now and what gets the job done good enough right now over the perpetual, over the internal, over the sacred, over something that lasts longer, over something that is sustainable in the long run, because, hey, who wants to go through all the work of trying to sit down and figure that out? And who cares about philosophy anyways? And who the heck is Aristotle anyways? So unfortunately, that's the kind of thinking that we have. A lot of our politicians, a lot of our decision makers, a lot of our very influential individuals in the world have very short time preferences, right? And this is why I am a non-conspiratorial uh, thinker, right? Again, I, I'm totally with so many of the individuals, uh, as I talked about yesterday. Going back to kind of the uh, the Microsoft, Bill Gates, you know, is this body motion sensor cryptocurrency thing evil and going to be used to insert vaccines into our bloodstream? Well, who knows? I mean, it just depends. We have to fight that. That I would consider as evil. Any kind of application of technology to reduce human liberty uh, is inherently evil in my book. And so we need to fight against that. But the development of a technology is neutral, in my opinion. Technologies are non-moral. Uh, the moral judgment comes from the human being doing the observer, just like... It's like, uh, you know, according to modern quantum physics, right, uh, you know, uh, an electron is a wave function until you look at it and then it's a particle, which whatever. Um, so having said that, um, yeah, so until we get individuals with high time preference in there, uh, which I think that, again, sound money is a natural progression of high time preference and Bitcoin is a um, Bitcoin is a work of an individual or group of individuals with a high time preference because it has a built-in deflationary system. It has a built-in uh, redundancy system. As it, it has a built-in democratic system of voting. It has a very efficient system, a uh, form of checks and balances between the miners, the end users, that IE, and when I say end users, I mean full node runners and developers. Developers influence the clients. Um, end users and nodes influence what blocks are accepted or rejected overall. They, they influence consensus in miners uh, and miners actually do the work of securing the network and creating the economic incentive to participate fairly in the mining. So it is a very quite well put together system. You know, the underlying Bitcoin protocol is quite a good economic system and a good base to develop sound money on, whereas the fiat system is not. It is a uh, it is an end result of short time preference. So going back to that conspiratorial thinking, right, and, and, and the whole the whole Bill Gates thing, right, you know, it's it's very, very common with with um, conspiratorial thinking that and, and I'm absolutely with you guys. There's a lot of weird stuff out there, right? There's a lot of weird stuff out there that that does come about through malevolence and maliciousness, right? And it is our job to fight that. But the idea that there are. That there is uh, like a cabal that's got it all figured out that runs the world. That's not what I see with the evidence of my eyes. The evidence that I see from my eyes is that most people are irresponsible, do not make good decisions, have short time preferences, right? So all of this malevolence that you see is generally not the result of some evil diabolical plan. It's the result of people being stupid and not thinking through the consequences of their actions and just doing what's in their best interest right now in the short term and just trying to bolt on and bandage and slap together these little palaces of power that individuals have been able to build around the world. And as much as I would love to believe that there's just this, you know, Enter complex evil web of super evil human persons that if we could just find them and put them in jail, it would all be laid to rest. It's not. I think that I think that the way that I view the world, the way that I view the world, which is through the lens of people are just generally irresponsible and make terrible decisions that have rolling effects that affect things negatively down the road. That's a harder problem to deal with. Right. That's a harder problem to deal with is to, how do we actually overcome our internal human innate desire to tend toward entropy and make poor decisions 
right? Because the only way around that is to be disciplined and self-sufficient and to make good decisions and have a high time preference. As opposed to just finding the one evil person and slapping the, slapping the cuffs on the wrist and saying, yep, got him, soldier. Now, that does not mean that there are not evil, malevolent people in the world. There certainly are, and those people need to be dealt with. Uh, and we need to figure out how to deal with, e you know, malevolence as a society, right? We need to stand against evil. But we have to be able to define evil. We have to be able to find evil. And we have to be able to cooperatively deal with evil in a way that is conducive to moving society forward and not in a way that, that uh, just makes us feel good, right? So vengeance just makes us feel good. Uh, just, you know, like revenge makes us feel good. Vengeance, eh, you know, justice. Just depends on your, <laughs> just depends on your, on your point of view. With that being said, when it comes to Bitcoin, let's get to the charts here in a little bit. I want to go over some news and talk about some things as we move forward. Some interesting developments, obviously, in the world of cryptocurrency. A lot of Tezos fans in the audience. I know I like Tezos, too. I got a Tezos bag. Uh, so any of the Tezos fans out there, chime in. Let us know what you're thinking. There is a new development from the world of Chainlink and Tezos. So I want to give you guys an update on that. Moving forward, we're also going to be talking about uh, kind of an update on the Props project. Obviously, I had a chance to speak with Jonathan Sella, who's the CEO of Props. We just uploaded that interview not too long ago, so make sure to go check that out. Jonathan is a very intelligent individual. It was a really my joy to speak with him. Uh, so check that interview out. So much going on. I think the Props Network and overall, their idea is pretty interesting. The blockchain that they developed, which is, you know, a way to incentivize. You know, you guys are watching on YouTube or Twitch or DLive, and DLive is a certain implementation implementation of something that props is trying to do like you could consider lino a direct competitor to props because they are trying to build this overarching user reward system that can be plugged into any kind of social media site where you have users so you could use props or lino uh theoretically on you know you can use lino currently on d live right props you can use currently on you now you could integrate props or lino into twitch or or excuse me, not a Twitch or Twitter or YouTube. And there are alternative blockchain based reward systems that incentivize users to participate in the network and they're good for the user and they're good for the content creator. So, and they're more fair, right? I think they're more fair. And the more decentralized we can build these systems, uh, this is, uh, this is good. Uh, then we'll also be giving you guys an update on Telegram. Of course, they've been battling it out with the SEC and they are really losing. So Telegram reaching out to the TON investors and saying, if you guys could just hold on for one more year, we got you. Please keep using our app. Don't go to Discord. Discord has terrible terrible memes and gifts. We have such better gifts over here on Telegram. So we'll give, a, give you guys an update on that. Uh, with that being said, if you guys are new to the channel, make sure to subscribe, hit the bell icon so you're always notified and smash that thumbs up button. It really does help get the word out there. Share this around to your friends, your family, people you don't even like. Well, that's, that's questionable. Onwards, guys, onwards. Let's get into the news. All right, so our first story of the day is going to be about Tezos. And as I said, the latest development coming from the Tezos project is that they will be adopting Chainlink. Yes, Chainlink, Sergey, to the moon as their Oracle provider. That will serve. So Chainlink is going to be serving uh, their, you know, their smart contracts and helping to bring a USD peg stablecoin to the network, right? That is overall their goal. They're going to be utilizing Chainlink as their Oracle on chain to get off chain data. And their overall goal is to build a stablecoin system and a stablecoin pegged to their network. Now, Chainlink, whose token L-I-N-K link, is one of the best performing assets in the crypto space over the past two years, shout out to 4chan, is a so-called Oracle project, right? For those of you who don't know, an Oracle project's aim is to connect blockchains to actual real world data, right? Or off-chain data, which is all, you know, which is not stored or derived on the blockchain itself. And it is you know, designed to deliver that data to a smart contract operating on the blockchain so that that smart contract can reference uh, data that is not stored on chain on the blockchain, right? Smart con So for example, a basic smart contract or your, or your, your default smart contract on Ethereum, for example, or on, or, or on Tezos or on Tron or on whatever platform uh, is going to be looking at 
data over here on chain, data over here on chain, and then executing an action on chain, right? Approving or denying something or moving funds around or whatever. Um, but once you start, you know, one, you know, th and that works for like simple things when you're only worried about, you know, well, how much Ethereum quantity of Ethereum is in this wallet? How much quantity of Ethereum is in this wallet, right? Okay. If A is larger than B, transfer B to A, right? You can do that stuff. But now that we are more concerned, and this is, of course, something that we cover with our trading all of the time, right? We, I am a USD-centric based trader, right? So I don't stack sats. I have, a, I have an investment in Bitcoin that I am happy with, and I regularly add to that through dollar cost averaging. Uh, but I treat my, my trading portfolio in terms of USD because that is what I currently pay my bills with. So I trade to increase my dollar value, so I take action based upon that. So for example, I will hedge my Bitcoin that is in my trading account with a future short contract. And I don't care if that hedge loses money because I don't lose money, I lose BTC, for example. On Bybit, if I open up a short for, let's say, $50,000 and price moves up 3%, well, I have lost 3% of whatever X amount of BTC was that position size, but my dollar value stays the same, right? Because going short 1X is hedging. You're, you're, you're flat in dollar terms because you're already holding that BTC, thus you're exposed. And I, of course, I've covered this in, in dozens and dozens and dozens of videos explaining the under, underlying hedging mechanics. Uh, we have uh, we have tons of videos dedicated to this, this concept in the premium trading group. It's something that we talk about all the time. Uh, so if you're new to the channel and this concept is new, new to you, just real, just remember, just understand, put this in your head for later. And for those of you guys who have been with us for, for, for months or years, you guys already know, and you're tired of me kicking a dead horse. Like that horse is way dead right now. I just want people to understand hedging works. Um, or how it works and how you can make it work for you and protect your dollar value, particularly in situations like right now. Um, if you're holding Bitcoin, you're spot long, and your dollar value, i.e. how much money you can trade your Bitcoin in, will fluctuate based on the market value of BTC USD. Simple concept. If you then open up a 1x short, utilizing that same Bitcoin as collateral, you are now flat. Meaning, the quantity of Bitcoin that you have will change depending on the success or failure of your trade, but the dollar value will be the same. So that is how you can lose Bitcoin but you have less Bitcoin, but that Bitcoin is more valuable per unit of Bitcoin now. Thus, the dollar value stays the same. Simple math, simple concept, but something that I go over all the time. Uh, so again, getting back to this, Chainlink Oracle is designed to give, transmit, beam, if you would, off-chain data onto an on-chain network. So the smart contract can now reference, for example, what is the exchange rate for Ethereum USD? So now we're not just interested in the quantity of FUSD, uh, Ethereum over here and the quantity of Ethereum over here. What's the dollar value? Of the ethereum over here and what's the dollar value of this ethereum over here and what if we want to get more complicated what if it's not just the dollar what if it's not just ethereum over here what if it's tron right we want to trade we want to do some smart contract between two participants in a smart contract where one participant has ethereum and one participant has tron they're able to do some kind of atomic swap or deal with some stable coin in between that is able to compensate because there's dollar valuation and thus we have to know what's the quantity of dollars that this ethereum over here is worth what's the quantity of dollars that this trx over here is worth. And if one is greater than the other, transfer the difference to a third wallet, which is like maybe a community wallet or maybe my wallet, hopefully, uh, worth of some stable coin, right? So we can do these things and you can just imagine the complex processes that we can build once we begin oracleizing data so that blockchains can reference off-chain data. Of course, this opens up lots of opportunities for bad oracles and bad data, but as with all things, constant improvement onwards crypto onwards with that being said <laughs> with that being said now what uh <laughs> you know so as i've talked about oracles are going to allow the developers of tezos here is build smart contracts to incorporate off-chain data or in this particular case to access external apis or trigger off-chain settlements uh chain links profile of course is continuing to rise in the cryptocurrency industry and i would say that that is largely thanks to a slew of new integrations that they've incorporated on chain over the past 18 months uh you know chain link is currently used in everything from powering pricing feeds that support decentralized finance on networks like ethereum to platforms offering aviation insurance sports memorabilia and now perhaps even a stable coin on the tezos network 
Now, Tezos in and of itself, of course, is a top 10 among cryptos by market capitalization. And this recent announcement from them has revealed that they will be utilizing Chainlink to access critical off-chain resources to help power their on-chain applications. As Tezos described here in their announcement, integrating Chainlink as their Oracle provider will, in their opinion, cement Tezos as the advanced ecosystem that they, are, that they want to be for developing next-generation decentralized applications or a DEPS, as we lovingly call them. Now, Chainlink's co-founder, Sergey Nazarov, chimed in on the news, stating that Tezos is one of the most advanced blockchains in the industry, and it offers many unique features that make it appealing not only to institutions, but also to developers to work on. So you typically say good things about your partners. Now, he explained, he went on to explain how the Tezos ecosystem is with this step making a big leap forward in its evolution as a smart contract platform through the integration of Chainlink as the Oracle that will serve up Tezos-based dApps uh, information, off-chain data, uh, to create a spectrum of valuable real-world resources which exist off-chain. Right, so integrating Chainlink as the Oracle provider is not a small task. And in this announcement, Tezos described that two teams of developers that work for Tezos are going to be responsible for doing so, for making this actually happen. You have Smart Chain Arena. They're a team of devs who created the Tezos Smart Contract Programming Language, Smart Pi, and Cryptonomic, who develops Tezos tools like their Galleon Wallet and Nautilus Cloud Service. So these two teams together are going to be leading the charge on Chainlink integration because it's not, you know, it's not drag and drop. You gotta do the code. Uh, so, uh, Cryptonomics, uh, Cryptonomic is, is based in New York City, and they are known for building finance applications, uh, as well as advising enterprise players on their blockchain strategies and builds. So, they've got a little bit of a pedigree there. Meanwhile, SmartPy, as I said earlier, is the smart contract uh, programming language unique to Tezos. Uh, the Pi refers to its architecture. Uh, it's it's based on a Python library, which means that contracts can freely inherit other contracts, which is a pretty useful feature when you're dealing with this multi-stage computation that oracles will provide, the ability to parse different data feeds. Now, Chainlink Network in and of itself has 30 independent node operators, many of which also have extensive experience as Tezos validators as well, interestingly enough, which Tezos touts as an advantage for seamless and secure integration of Link as the chain Oracle provider. So pretty set up to do this fairly efficiently, fairly well. Now, Tezos prides itself on being a reliable and mission critical blockchain, which ideally is going to be suited for financial applications. And by bringing Chainlink and Oracle services to the platform, Tezos says this will allow them and allow their developers to rapidly build out their DeFi ecosystem. Well, I'm not really into rapid building of DeFi, but hey, more power to you. Now, stablecoins, we cover a lot. They're already on uh, under development on the Tezos chain, including their flagship stablecoin, USD Tez. And it's expected that adoption of Chainlink is going to be a pretty big step for them in getting this actually launched in other fiat pegged assets. All right. Now, the co-founder of Cryptonomics uh, spoke in, I think it's this. Uh... Hmm, let's find it. Is it? Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right, here we go. Sorry. So, um, I always mispronounce the name, but it's uh, V-Shock, I believe, co-founder of Tezos said right here. Stable coins are essential to get on chain to get an on chain economy going on Tezos. Right. Uh, and, you know, overall, pretty positive about the launch. Uh, they go on to say some more positive things about uh, about Chainlink, how you know secure and reliable, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, uh, Tezos developers are also going to be looking to develop other financial services that are going to be powered by Chainlink's Oracle data. Uh, they want to provide insurance services to, for developing countries who don't have traditional financial products available to them, which is generally an impetus of what blockchain developers want to build opportunities for the edge cases. Now, 
Chainlink's biggest role right now is Oracle on the Ethereum network, uh, where it does provide market data for around 30 different price feeds, which are absolutely crucial to the operations of all the decentralized finance dApps on that platform. Right. And again, according to Nazarov, the COVID pandemic hasn't slowed down development at Chainlink. According to him, they're busier than ever before as more projects continue to choose Link as their Oracle provider, which, you know, makes a whole lot of sense. Right. When I was at San Francisco Blockchain Week 2019, I spoke to a lot of I spoke to a lot of developers. I spoke to a lot of projects about, you know, what 2018 was like for them, right? Because most traders or most Bitcoin investors will say, oh, 2017 was so great. And then 2018 came along and price go down. It was so terrible. Oh, I called my mom. It was so bad. Right. And uh, but, you know, when you talk to developers, they're like, yeah, 2018 was great, man. You know, price went way up. We made a whole lot of money. Our ICOs did very well. And we put our heads down and we built. Right. You know, we're developers anyway, so we like to generally stick around the house. So I don't really think, you know, again, not to be cliched, not to be cliched towards uh, towards developers. But I mean, they tend to be, you know, there's a stereotype for developers, right, where, you know, they sit in the lab and, you know, they drink a lot of Jolt Cola and they do a lot of developing and they smash it out. So it's like, you know, and sometimes like once a week, they're like, oh, hey, is it summer already? And they finally like open the window and it's like, ah, light, ah, right. Uh, so I don't really think uh, pandemic lockdown really affected them. They probably looked around and they're like, what, I can't go to the grocery store right now? Who? Who said this? Right. Uh, now, yesterday, Casper Labs, who uh, I also had the um, I had the pleasure of interviewing their CEO at San Francisco Blockchain Week. We haven't uploaded that video yet, but that will be out and coming here pretty soon. Uh, but I spoke to, to Casper Labs CEO at San Francisco Blockchain Week, but Casper Labs yesterday announced their own collaboration with Chainlink. Uh, so they're going to make it also the Oracle provider for all the applications that are going to be developed on its blockchain as well. So uh, Casper Labs is actually going a step further than just using Link for Oracle provider. Uh, it is going to be the first blockchain platform to use Chainlink as an actual internal component of the core platform architecture. And at the rate things are moving at Chainlink, it's probably not going to be the last time that a blockchain actually decides to integrate it in such a fashion. So what do you guys think, right? Is this more bullish news on Link? Do we have any members of the Link army here on the channel? Be sure to tell us how hyped you are or excited or negative you are about Link in the comments section down below, as well as Tezos as well, of course. So now our next story before we get over to price things that I think are interesting. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the Props Project. We just recently, as I said, featured an interview with the co-founder of Props, Yana Tinsella, on our channel here. You guys can check that out in the Cryptocurrently playlist. Uh, Props, of course, is aiming to build this platform where users can be rewarded for their engagement on social networks or media networks. And as a result, it has a number of de uh, decentralized applications, including uh, their now, it's pretty flagship, dating.com service. Well, the newest news coming out of props is that they are migrating from their own private blockchain to that of the public Algorand chain. And again, also spoke with Silvio McCauley. That interview is also here on the channel. Algorand is a pretty ambitious and cutting edge proof of stake blockchain platform whose founder, Silvio McCauley, is a true crypto cryptography pioneer, right? He's a Turing Award winner, MIT professor, and I was very pleased to interview him last year at San Francisco Blockchain Week. So again, that's one of the best interviews that we've done. Make sure to check that out. But going back to the Props platform, it is an independent network of apps, and they use the Props token as a reward mechanism for participation or engagement by users. For those of you guys who aren't familiar with the use of this thing, very similar to Lino. Uh, Props currently boasts over 3 million users across a variety of apps, and it runs on their own Props chain. It's a private fork of Ethereum that currently handles about 50,000 transactions an hour. Also, uh, interesting here to note that Props was, of course, of the uh, two uh, SEC A certification um, token offerings, right? You have Props and you have uh, block stack, right? So props was the first, I guess, approved token sale in the United States, right? Now, however, to achieve greater scalability and transparency, the company is going to move over to Algorand's public blockchain. They're going to migrate off of their own internal blockchain onto Algorand's, right? If, you know, why, why not if it works better? Right? Now, Algorand CEO Stephen Kokinos uh, spoke to Cointelegraph for this interview and described how Algorand is unlike the first generation of blockchains in the sense that it doesn't sacrifice scalability for security or decentralization. Of course, when I spoke to uh, uh, when I spoke to Silvio, he was explaining to me why he decided to build 
uh, why he decided to build Al uh, Algorand in the first place, and it's to solve the blockchain trilemma, which Vitalik himself was never able to come up with a good solution to. Uh, but according to him, he said up until now, people would have to really deploy private blockchains in order to get the scale and thorough put if they had large user bases. And if they didn't, then they could consider a decentralized system. I think from the prop standpoint, it's an application or a group of applications that really makes more sense on a public network, but they just didn't have an avenue to do it. So we're excited to see them deploy an algorithm and bring their users onto the network. So this is you know pretty good for Algorand, pretty good from uh, pretty good for Algorand, pretty good for um, uh, uh, props as well. Now, uh, talking about their their dating.com app, this is a pretty conglomerate. This is like a conglomerate of 15 international dating apps. It's got, they got 73 million registered users between them, right? Uh, they invested in the props project and they intend to integrate props into some of their applications as well, right? Um, now, According to this, Nick Grossman, Union Square Ventures, which is another Props project investor, said that Props is bringing one of crypto's killer features, enabling participants to share in the wealth generated on the networks that they help grow to mainstream apps, which, of course, is something that I'm pretty positive about. Of course, I'm not a huge fan of the monetization systems that YouTube offers to a lot of content creators, right? A lot of individuals out there uh, who are just content creators struggle under this system, right? And again, you kind of get this monopoly of the provider of the platform and again the whole are they a publisher uh, or are you know are they are they a publisher or are they simply a hosting site right when you get into you know censorship or any of these kind of other issues that have been cropping up lately and of course lots and lots and lots of crypto commentators um getting getting their 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 uh, their content demonetized or getting their content uh, removed or flagged or banned or struck. Uh, so of course, this is always a danger about relying on a centralized uh, on a centralized system. Now, blockchain has often been criticized for a lack of adoption. So to see its adoption by a consumer facing project with millions of users is a very promising sign. Now we just need Reddit or something similar to hop on board uh, would be would be pretty helpful right now. All right, anyways, our final story is going to be an update. Uh, we covered this again. Uh, an update to something we've been following for quite some time, and it is the utter disaster that the Telegram token offering has become in recent months for investors in the TON project. Uh, with the SEC investigation and subsequent court order that froze Telegram's issuance of the Gram token to investors and delaying the launch of their actual network uh, being done, things are looking pretty dire for the project in general. However, in a bid to salvage their TON network, Telegram is now offering investors an interesting deal that will hopefully buy them some time to actually be able to see their project come to fruition, to see the project through. So the last time that we covered the Telegram launch, we explained how beleaguered investors were being offered 72% of their capital back if they wish to walk away now and liquidate their stake in the blockchain project. This is after the, the TON Gram launch to, uh, distribution was blocked by the SEC and it pushed back the actual launch of the network to April 30th, 2020, which is today. Right? Well, it seems that Telegram will fail to meet its revised launch date after failing to come to a resolution with the regulators in time. But out of the blue, Telegram has now extended a new offer to investors today, an option that will lend their invested capital to Telegram for a year in exchange for equity share in the company. So basically, you know, turning out to the investors who gave them the money and saying, hey, listen, we're totally willing to give you your money back, but if you just let us hold on to it for one year, you get a stake in our company. Uh, this, new deal, this new deal means that if investors were to treat their invested capital in the Telegram Open Network TON project as a loan to the firm, they would be given their entire investment back along with an extra 10% ROI. Uh, the returns would allegedly be doled out in April 2021. And one critical detail to note is that the return investment would be in equity shares rather than cash, which, you know, maybe this is good. Maybe this is bad. Now, Gabriel Shapiro, who is an attorney focused on our space, spoke to the writer of this article, 
And his take was largely positive on this news, right? He explained how it's largely a good outcome for Telegram investors that they thought that they were buying a token that would be directly integrated into the Telegram app and whose value would likely rise with Telegram's network effect. Now, while that token may not come to pass the way that they thought, the equity shares being offered as substitutes are similar enough to the original concept to potentially satisfy investors who were actually banking on the popularity and continued growth of Telegram in the first place. So they have the option, if they don't think that their investment was well staked and the popularity and continued growth of Telegram, they can walk away, of course. Now, although Telegram did launch this successful $1.7 billion token sale in 2018, it has never been possible to own traditional equity in Telegram. So this proposed equity option, now it might prevent investors from liquidating their stakes immediately, uh, which if enough agree to it, is gonna buy the TON firm enough time to find a long-term solution or possibly you know, yeah, kind of figure it out with regulators down the road without returning the money it's raised to date. Right. Uh, so, you know, if investors take the new deal that's currently on the table, they can be among the first venture investors in Telegram's equity. Right. Which is a likely most likely for them a better investment than the tokens in the first place if Telegram is successful. Right. Now, if the investors decide to liquidate their token investment, uh, they can walk away with 72 percent of their investment. Right. The company and investors mutually agreed on this figure when the issuance of tokens was first postponed back in January of 2020. So just following through on what they already agreed with. Now, of course, this means that investors are going to be left to choose one of two options, sell their stake for 72% of what it was worth immediately, or lend it out for another year and receive 10% of their capital in the form of Telegram shares, which is actually, I mean, depending on if, if, if you're bullish on Telegram moving forward, it's a pretty good deal because they've never offered public equity in their company's firm. But in order to materialize that 110% return, investors have to bet that the company will raise a fresh round of investments next year. Like only then would they have the opportunity to sell their equity holdings, right? This is how funding works, right? The second wave of funding goes back, goes to pay back the first wave of funding and the third and so on and so on and so forth. And then it's actually company profits after your company's been running for like five years that actually go back, go to pay back your last term, your last leg of investors, right? Uh, so those, those bullish on the prospects of Telegram are going to take the deal. And the rest of the investors are going to be walking away with 72% of their capital in cash. Uh, you know, it just depends on who does what and how many does what. It was a little over a month ago that the New York District Court slammed the, the slam Telegram with an order to halt the disbursement of their tokens in the first place. Right, Their token raise was deemed an unregistered security offering by the SEC. And many of those who invested in the project uh, live in the United States. Right? A lot of TON investors live in the United States. So this was like, no good. You got to make up to them. You got to figure this out. So this latest development means that if Telegram is unable to come to an understanding with U.S. regulators between now and April of 2021, investors are at the very least assured to have their own equity in the fifth largest messaging app in the world. So let me know what you guys think. What would you do if you were in that situation? Would you take the shares? Would you take the money and run, even though it's 72% of what you initially put in? But hey, you know, like three quarters of a bird in the hand is worth three quarters of a bird in the bush. Type thinking. I don't know. Anyways, with that being said, guys, thank you guys so much. Make sure to like, share, and subscribe. Uh, I'm going to be moving on over to the charts now for today's market analysis. Let us know any questions, thoughts, comments, opinions, concerns, death threats. Those go in DM that you have, and the moderators will bring them to my attention. All right, so here we are in Bitcoin. We've actually had a little bit of a more negative push down over the last, you know, about 30 minutes that I was ranting and raving about Telegram and all that. Uh, so on the daily time frame, uh, we've got a pretty interesting chart here. Uh, we've got price continuing to slip down now at 84.59. So overall, we've had more than a thousand dollar pullback since the daily close last night, right? Price reached up, had a nice blow off top up to the $9,500 area. Didn't quite broach 9,500. Depends on what exchange you were on. Uh, but overall, this is where we currently sit on the daily time frame. We are seeing it 84. 88. Uh, price is above the daily baseline. Overall trend directional bias is bullish, is to the upside. All right. Uh, Wada Tar explosion still giving us uh, Wada Tar explosion is still giving us bullish 
Uh, Delta right now at this point in time with a rising explosion level, meaning that the Bollinger Bands are still separating. Volatil volatility is still increasing. While volatility is increasing, there's lots of opportunities on different time frames for profitable trades because price is moving more rapidly. Of course, it also means that you need to have a firm risk management strategy because price is moving rapidly. Uh, Parallax is to the upside and still pointing up even on today's candle, meaning that our overall momentum oscillator is still bullish. And we'll kind of get some uh, uh, we'll get some impending ideas on this when we actually go over and look at um go over and look at the spy because we're going to be using that as well uh looking at minx we are broached into the overbought area minx sitting at 132.2 noise is sitting at 105.9 Meaning that even our noise line, our signal line, for those of you guys who are familiar with two line crossing indicators, uh, is above the overbought level. Now, we haven't gotten any cross under. Price hasn't recovered from overbought. So we haven't got the confirmation that, hey, we've gone up and pulled back. Now, from a pure candlestick analysis, sure, it does look negative. But I think that everybody calling for price to just drop off a cliff right here are a little bit wrong. Uh, is, uh, is a little bit wrong. All right, yeah. So uh, as to what exchange this is, this is the uh, this is the Bybit chart. Eighty nine forty seven. Eighty nine forty seven is current price. Eighty nine forty three point five. Sorry, price changing quite quickly. All right. With that being said, let's go over and look at Ethereum as well. Oh, sorry, we weren't even like nearly done with the daily here because we do have. I do have some more things to talk about. All right, so that's just the simple baseline. Let's actually look at the breaking Bitcoin system. All right, breaking Bitcoin system is steady as she goes. Long invalidation. If we end up closing the daily below 78.73, it's going to invalidate a bullish trends. That's basically back down or return to the range, giving the trade a lot of room to breathe, looking for these higher prices. Of course, we'll get to this in just a little bit, talk about a little bit more nuance. Uh, let's see here. Other things to talk about. Do we have anything from the Minx exit system? No, not currently at this point in time. Of course, bottom feeder is not going to be signaling. The last bottom feeder trade that we got was over here. So, of course, we're not looking for bottoms. Uh, but we've covered baseline. We've covered Quadrigo. Uh, if one was to look for longs from current levels, current take profit level would be 89.56, stretching up to the third take profit of 99.12 in validation, basically right where the continuation filter is, where the overall invalidation level is at 77.63 on the daily time frame there. All right. Uh, Ethereum uh, overperforming uh, the movement to the downside. So again, still looking at the daily time frame, overall trend directional bias is to the upside. Trades should be taken in the direction of the upside right now, still while price is above the baseline. And Ethereum poked its head briefly down into the optimum entry area between 202.81 and 188.76, which is the area between the entry qualifier and the baseline. So if price falls within those areas, those are the levels where we want to look on the mesos or on the daily. On the mesos, this is kind of going to fit with our oversold conditions, right? Because price is getting oversold as we approach the daily baseline on different time frames. And so those can represent reversals within the trend, reversal buying opportunities. Or on the daily, typically what we do is price comes back and we look for those continuation long opportunities. That hasn't occurred yet at this time. We're just in the midst of experiencing this nice pullback. Uh, let's look at the BB system here. Uh, breaking Bitcoin system has price bullish above 196.08. A daily close below 196.08 is going to invalidate longs at this point in time. 181.74 have actually flipped the trend uh, completely bearish and having us taking at risk shorts as we trade along with the direction of the trend. All right, looking at two hour Cybot hasn't given us any signals yet at this point in time. Neither has the four hour Cybot uh, since the four hour and the two hour got the movement to the upside yesterday and closed those trades out successfully. Now, I do know that the Cybot has gone ahead and generated, I think, about six short signals today on different uh, alt USDTs because we do have it running for Binance pairs as well for those who have the availability to Binance margin. So it is pretty active over there in capturing those movements, but so far not signaling anything on the actual Bitcoin. Bitcoin pairings. Uh, looking at the super lower time frames and looking at the ISIS spot today, we are dipping our toes on the 45 minute here into the oversold territory. So I actually think uh, between 8455 and 8400, I think we have a good potential here to actually, uh, you can see that we've swept the previous low. I think that a lot of individuals are trying to short this level right now. Minx, standard Minx is basically oversold as we are, and the ISIS spot is almost oversold as we are. Doesn't mean that we're actually going to be getting that buy signal, uh, but but I do think that within the course of the day, whether it actually happens today or by candle close tomorrow, I think that if worst case scenario, right, if price is going to actually continue a little bit lower and, you know, go back down to 8,000, go back down to 8,200, 
then price should return to the point of control, today's point of control, which is up at 88.54, which means that individuals selling out of their positions due to panic or looking to short sell right now, uh, I think are getting it at about a 5% worse price, at about a 5% worse price than they potentially could with price slipping right now below today's uh, overall highest traded range, right? We broke down below yesterday's point of control. So just looking at the volume profile here, where are previous shelves where we can find support? Right here at 83.15. And I talked about this at length yesterday at 81.26 and at 79.54, right? And at 79.54. And we talked about this over here, kind of worst case scenario coming back down to this level that didn't really get tested, this inefficiency in the market that didn't get tested, which, you know, we're a far ways off from price going down to test those areas, but that's down at the 7100s. So in simpler terms, I think that within the next hour to two hours, I think that we are going to see buying pressure come in. Uh, because we are reaching these oversold levels of, of course, we've got to wait for the objective signal. We actually have to see market participants and price line up to give the correct signal. But again, just following this, uh, looking for that movement to the upside off this initial oversaws. And, and again, the majority of the time, even after a highly volatile movement, we do retrace and retest the point of control from the previous day. Which again, as I said, sitting up at about 88.59 in today's current traded range. So do I think that price is going to fall off a cliff? And do I think that shorting here makes a lot of sense? No, I really don't. I think that if one is bearish, I think that the better entries are to come in between 88.48 if one wanted to reshort the retest of the point of control and the breakdown of that. Um, and again, if we can get back above 88.48, 88.50 here uh, and start consolidating, get a nice push to the upside, uh, then so be it. And again, depending on the next 45 minute close, we actually might get uh, the buy signal here on the lower, on the meso time frame, on the lower time frames today. So I'll be watching that. Of course, the Renko trend has flipped bearish. Uh, the Ethereum trend, the Ethereum trend has flipped bearish as well. Uh, looking at the CME futures, this is exactly what we talked about. We did end up overshooting the gap fill, which does often happen. Of course, it occurred on the second daily candle. And we are still nicely consolidating within that gap range. And this is exactly what I talked about yesterday, right? We've got, uh, you know, consolidation here within this range of the gap that we filled earlier would objectively be good to see. It would objectively be good to see if we can hold 8280 here on the CME chart, consolidate uh, at resistance, which is always good to see. Of course, I'd like to see that consolidation occur closer to 8900, closer to 9000. That would be foretelling that we end up pushing the range, whereas consolidation closer to 8200, closer to 8400 would generally indicate that we are going to break down and maybe potentially revisit and retest our lows. But of course, what's nice about being a trend following trader is that we're going to know as soon as price is actually bearish because we don't trade reversals, we trade trends. And the trend does not flip bearish off of one candle, ladies and gentlemen. So again, overall trend is still bullish. Nice sell pressure right here. Nice blow off top. Let's wait for a pullback and we can look for nice continuation entries. And again, probably by the time we get there, that continuation filter is going to be in the vicinity of the $8,200 area, which is basically right at a bit, uh, which is just right about where that lower boundary of the CME gap that we ended up filling is. So a lot of confluence in the area. I do like it. Uh, looking over all at... Classical technical analysis. Just for you guys. Just because I do like you. We do see that the RSI ended up getting overbought on yesterday's candle. Generally, uh, generally, yes, generally when the RSI is overbought, we can get some selling pressure. Doesn't work too well in a highly bullish trend. Look at all these times the RSI gets overbought uh, on the first candle and yes, does get some downward sell pressure. But again, I want to point this out. Like, let's look at the last bullish trend that Bitcoin had over here, right? RSI gets overbought here with a little bit of downwards and then back up. So again, the overall trend is bullish. The right move is not to short the market. The right move is to wait for the pullback and then go long again, right? Here we get RSI overbought. You get a pullback for one candle. If you shorted there, you got punched in the face, most likely got out during this chop uh and again it occurs over here and it occurs over here so uh and we can go back you know worse you know, there's even obviously much worse offenders over here and over here and over here again this is probably the most uh this is probably the worst offender on the daily going back to april of 2019 where our side just stayed pegged for a very 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 long time as price continued to just trudge and punch you in the face and overall you can see that shorting pretty much anywhere in this range makes no sense from a macro perspective no sense from a macro perspective 
What's next, MACD? Yes, MACD is next. I'm so glad that you asked, Don Candon. I'm so glad that you asked. It's, it's, it's spelled L-E-A-V-E-S. It's not leaves. It's leaves. Yeah, you got it right, bro. Don't worry about it. Uh, but on the MACD, MACD line is still above the signal line. Both still turning to the upside. The histogram is still getting more powerful. Uh, no divergence coming in from the MACD whatsoever. So overall looking pretty healthy. OBV is still positive. On balance volume is still positive, has pointed down, but overall negative volume has not, to, of course, taken advantage. And the daily stokes have crossed into the overbought territory and have given us a nice cross down, which doesn't really surprise me on the volatility of today's daily candle. So the next two daily candles will be a little bit more indicative. I would honestly look to see a consolidation on Friday, not a whole lot of activity on Saturday or Sunday, except for a push back up to retest that level of about 8,800, uh, excuse me, 80, yeah, 8,800 is what I'd like to see occur on Saturday or Sunday. And then whatever happens on Monday is going to be indicative of how of where we move for the next five days, for the next week, right? It is Thursday. I don't really expect to see a significant amount of follow-through after this movement to the downside. I'm not really expecting a huge death candle, but that's because I overall don't believe the price is bearish. I'm going to be okay if it does. My trades are in no-loss positions, right? So... Uh, and overall, uh, we kind of have the invalidation area here with the classical TA with the 21 exponential moving average sitting around 78.92, which has good confluence with what we just looked at with my version of trading, my style of trading, looking at the... Um breaking Bitcoin system. All right. And we can see, so for those of you who just refuse to believe, all right, so we can see, here's the S&P 500. What is it doing? All day today. What has the S&P done all day today? It's sold off a cliff. Hmm. Bitcoin doesn't track the S&P. I wonder. Here's the NASDAQ. Done nothing but sell off all day. Huh. Here's the Dow. What has it done? Done nothing but sell off all day. Interesting. Uh, what... What's the Russell doing? Selling off. What's VIX doing? Spiking. What's the Euro dollar doing? Pumping because money wants to flow into liquidity. What's gold doing? Dumping. What's silver doing? Dumping. Right? So... And looking at how the actual uh, but again, overall, I would say that the movements, again, not something like significant to call home to mom about unless we're seeing an island reversal. We've seen this exact same thing happen, right? Uh, again, we are starting to see. Uh, let's just track the SPY over here for the last few days, right? Uh, typically, we've had this process of gapping up, gapping down, gap up, gap up, gap up. A lot of chopping consolidation in this area. And if we kind of see that same thing, we have not broken back down below our last high, which is going to be sitting at about 286.81 on the SPY right here. Uh, basically, just coming back to that level, back testing that as resistance. I don't really like to see the market gap down, but... And you guys can see the fallout of the uh, of the FOMC decision with the Dixie falling back into its overall range right here between 99.91 and 98.27, right? Now, uh, looking at the Dixie, uh, this is a nice M pattern right here. And so what I'd like to see right now, again, not trading the Dixie, but we can use it as kind of what's indicative of the strength of the dollar moving forward. Strength of the dollar is generally good for, I mean, it's, uh, it's the correlation there. There's a lot of different competing theories on this. Uh, but again, uh, break out above the Dixie, if we can get the Dixie above 99.91. Now, at this point in time, uh, if this was an asset that I'd trade, I mean, that would be a very classic uh, M pattern. You go long and your stop loss goes at your previous low. All right, and you go for a 2 to 1 risk to reward ratio. Okay. Not, of course, something that we're going to be doing. We're just tracking this as an index to see what overall, you know, for me anyways, what the Forex currency pairs are going to be doing. Uh, we can see oil, again, continuing to have nice moves to the upside. We actually closed out, which I'm glad, because we closed out our oil short on this candle right here, and, 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 and some marginal profit on, well, at least on the CFD. We made good money on the USO ETF, but, but yeah, oil actually having a nice push to the upside here, so we'll be monitoring that. Silver having a wild day, spot gold having a wild day, T-notes continuing to spike as the Dixie slips, so a, quite a significant shift in, in investor confidence and what people actually want to hold over the last two days. So again, market extremely fickle right now, a lot of opportunity for trades at this point in time. So I'm really kind of happy with my overall portfolio exposure at this point in time. Now, while we're over here,
Oh, let's look at the Euro Yen. Euro Yen ended up hitting trailing stop. Aussie Kiwi is going to be an exit today. NL25 is going to be an exit today. Pound Kiwi is going to be an exit. So pretty much quick reversal on a lot of things, especially with Boris Johnson's comment earlier, pushing the pound up, showing some nice strength from the pound. Uh, Aussie Dollar is probably going to be an exit as well. Euro Swissy likely an exit. Again, all of these is, have hit TP1, so we're just... Uh, uh, so we're just um, either hitting our trailing stop losses or closing out profitable trades. So overall, things are pretty good. Uh, took the long on uh, on the overall submetals index yesterday. Beautiful gap up to the upside for me. Gap down on 10. Uh, went long on Coco as well, getting that to the upside as well. The only thing uh, that's actually bad, and you can see that uh, uh, that uh, uh, that uh, the, the toy cream QQQ here, which I actually took some long exposure to, uh, actually gapped up, and it's just back down to my entry price right now. So, Uh, Zuhair Nakvi uh, with a $10 tip. What's going on, my friend? Can the Ichimoku cloud predict the future? I had my first take profit at 94.80, which is the Senko Spawn B of the weekly Kumo cloud, and we topped exactly there, but I jumped into the five minute chart and sabotaged it. Classic Zuhair. Um, I mean, the short answer is, of course, no. The Ichimoku cloud cannot predict the future. You know, this is the kind of the problem. So again, the Ichimoku, I have a full video on this. The Ichimoku is a beautiful, robust trading system because trading Ichimoku forces you to follow rules, right? It has a rule set. There are ways to trade it. There are right ways to trade it. There are wrong ways to trade it. It has multiple layers of confirmation, uh, and you can make it as simple or as granular as you like. Um, however... There's nothing that's ever 100% accurate because, you know, and this is exemplified very well. Mark Douglas has a very nice story about this in his book, Trading in the Zone, where he talks about, you know, a, a trading desk executive or, or, you know, kind of manager, pit boss. Uh, and one of the traders comes up to him and shows him all his support and resistance lines on the chart. And he's like, hey, man, I think they were talking about, I think it's corn. And he's like, look, price is going to turn around here. So we should totally short right here, right? Or I think it was, uh, no, he was going, trying to go long. He's like, look, price has been dumping, but look at my support level. We're going to bounce here and move to the upside. So we should totally buy. And he's like, oh, price is going to turn around there. Okay. And it's like, for sure, like your TA says that. Okay. And then he picks up the phone and he calls the broker and he says, hey, dump like 2 million lots of, of corn. And price just goes, boom, like red candle right through his support line. And he's like, listen, if I can do that, Anybody can do that, right? If I can pick up the phone and call, I'm not the only person holding 2 million lots of corn. So your TA doesn't account for nothing. Now, that's not quite true. Technical analysis does help us have higher success as a trader, but it's not. it doesn't help us predict the future. Uh, it, it helps give us a higher statistical edge, which is our edge in the market. That's how we're able to profit. So... Uh, you know, the Ichimoku is really good. The Ichimoku is quite precise. A lot of individual traders are going to be tracking those prices, but don't fall into the trap of being Bob, the moving average guy, right? So Bob, the moving average guy will come out of the woodwork anytime you say anything about price and say, well, but did you consider the 39.62 moving average? It is never given a signal like this ever. Did you consider that in your analysis? And it's like, no, because you're the only person right now who cares about that moving average. And maybe the seven other people who are like creating a rouse. Like, so every time you see this on the crypto news, like, or in general news, like all the time, it happens in crypto. It doesn't happen in traditional markets because traditional markets are like way past that. Right. Um, but you'll always hear like, you know, some new moving average or this new indicator that called the last bottom just generated another signal today. What does it mean? Stay tuned. And it's like garbage, dude. Like, no, no. Like maybe it did. Maybe it's awesome. Maybe it's the coolest thing. I'm not ranting at you, by the way. I, this is just my behavior. But, uh, but like, you know, there are tried and true stable methods of TA that work very, very well. Ichimoku happens to be one of those, right? Um, you don't need exotic settings, you know. Uh, exotic settings are just going to, um, exotic settings are just going to curve fit your results, right? Because they're not going to be consistent over time. There's no magical settings that the whales use. Uh, but Ichimoku is a very good system. And again, I am very pleased to hear that you're having good results, my friend. Yeah, the esoteric exponential squad. Yeah, that's that's exactly what it is. Yeah, we got. So if you guys look at the chart, we got the Kijun, the Senku, the Surge Tonkin over here. Slightly inside joke there. 
Y'all laughed at me when I shorted Tyson Foods. Y'all laughed at me. Who's laughing now? All right, with that being said, uh, let's get back over to the markets and monitor. What? Green candle, right? Where I said there'd be one? <laughs> but for real. If you guys haven't watched, so I watched, I did watch Lemony Snicket, the movie last night with my, uh, with my daughter. Really good movie. I liked it. I thought it was good. I like Jim Carrey though. Not his social or political views, but his acting is top notch. I think we're going to watch The Mask tonight. Thank you so much, Mr. Ether. Smiles and energy today, man. Hey, it, it's good stuff, man. Uh, agency says, what do I think of a fundamental play on Beyond Meat, given all, given all of this negative stuff happening to meat processing and storage and whatnot? Yeah, I, I, did, I did the exact same thing. I mean, the technicals lined up for a Tyson short, and I am now playing my Tyson short Kind of by my kind of by my outlook on the market, um, you know, I decided to hold it open despite the announcement by Trump because I think that the actual market drive is to push to the downside, and so I'm essentially bank banking on, I'm essentially banking on the fact that there's not much that they can do. That just with oil, like you could not stop the collapse of oil. And I'm assuming that you know, again, if I could directly speculate and short sell cow or actually get into some of the other processing plants, but I think Tyson is a good proxy for that. I'm not sure why you do Beyond Meat. Just because it's like a hot stock, right? Um, I think that, you know, actually banking on the more fundamental or higher liquidity assets is going to be better. I wouldn't really touch Beyond Meat. I don't really like to touch Glamour stocks. Uh, by Glamour stocks, I mean like, you know, what's the latest in the news, right? Tesla. Um, you know. Does shorting Tyson make me vegan? I'll have you know this, sir. We lift some heavy weights around here and we eat a lot of meat. Total non-vegetarian. But, you know, again, I love vegetables, dude. Like, I am grilling squash. I'm grilling asparagus. I got zucchini out in the garden. Got pumpkin out in the garden. One of my favorite dishes is just boiled pumpkin. I get it in. Oh, I see what you're saying. So you're saying you're saying to go long on like vegan burgers because there's a supply shortage with actual meat. Well, I mean, I think that's why, as I said in yesterday's premium mentoring session, I actually think that grains are a little oversold. Now, there are other reasons for that, but that is certainly an interesting play. Yeah, Brussels sprouts. Yeah, best believe I'm gonna get mine. Yeah. Yes, sir. Smash them down, put a little salt on them. Man. Oh, yeah, I got a garden, man. It's what I initially went to college for was entrepreneurial and diversified agriculture. <laughs> Somebody said the meat counter was totally empty except for Beyond Meat burgers. Yeah, I, I maybe so maybe it's location because I don't really see that like where I'm at.
yeah, strangely satisfying stuff to watch on YouTube, like vegetable gardening stuff. Um, <laughs> Don Candon with the 20 crones. Uh, sorry to be annoying. What kind of watch is this? This is, uh, this was a gift from my friend. So this is from Dakota Watch Company. Uh... I'm not exactly sure what the model is. Uh, I don't know. I know you can just search for Dakota Watch Company. They're pretty reasonably priced, and they're really nice. Uh, high quality watches. They only got, like, if you go to their website, they got, like, five watches. And it's the gold one. Only my close friends agency. Only my close friends. Yep, I've I've done aquaponics and aeroponics. Yep. Well, you got to buy your friends lunch, man. Got to make sure everybody eats. All right, guys, listen. What time is it? It's 114 already? Oh, man, I hate to do this. But we gotta run. Listen, so much to cover. All right, guys, listen. Sorry we gotta run, but of course, it is that time. We, we'd love to do two hours, but we've got so much to do today. We're adding so many new features to Cybot. We're, we're, we've got... Uh, uh, it's the end of the month, so there's a lot of processing that needs to be done. Uh, it's just those, those days, my friend. Uh, thank you guys so much for joining me for another exciting episode of Breaking Bitcoin Market Analysis brought to you by the Cracking Cryptocurrency Premium Trading Group. Of course, there's never been a time to sign up and begin trading with us, take advantage of everything that we have to offer. Link is in the description. You can find out everything that we offer, including proprietary indicators, signals, strategies, education, and more, as well as our mentoring community. Uh, Premium.crackingcryptocurrency.com if the scroll bar on your mouse seems to be broken. Also, what should not be broken is this button right here. Use it to click, right? Make sure to click that, sm <laughs> make sure to click that like button uh, and the subscribe button if you have not already and you've smashed the bell icon, then you will be notified when we go live instead of having to find out that we're shadow banned and like find out 45 minutes later, right? So the bell icon is how you avoid that because even if you're subscribed, there's no guarantee that you will get a notification. The bell icon makes sure that you will. Um, if you guys have any questions, comments, concerns, sarcastic remarks, or death threats, please leave them in the comment section down below. I'll do my best to get back to you within the next 24 to 48 hours. I look forward to catching you all on Discord. Listen, guys, a lot of exciting stuff today. Overall summary, I think we're going to see a pushback up to the $8,400 $8, area, which represents an area where one can actually get out at a good price for the long if they're worried about price dipping and potentially take speculative shorts, which I don't recommend because the overall trend is not bearish. But for you reversal traders out there, there are better ways to get in. There is a better price to get in. Not really expecting a massive movement to the downside, expecting consolidation throughout today and tomorrow, and we'll see what happens come Monday. But Saturday and Sunday, I would expect pretty bullish push up. Maybe not above highs, but like maybe that the retracement. So we see some consolidation and then movement up on Saturday. Again, overall trend is bullish. Uh, we do see some interesting movements coming out of the precious metals. So I do expect some of our safety currencies, some of our safety commodities to move up over the next few days. So there are going to be potential plays there. But keep in mind that it is Thursday. We're getting close to the end of the week. So you want to be careful with your speculative over the weekend holds if you don't trade the way that I do. If you trade the way that I do, then you're just going to be taking the signals that your system gives you and you don't even have to worry about the fundamentals. Having said that, having said that, I think it's a great time to take profits, enjoy the successful weeks that you've had trading. We've had some real big winners over the last few weeks. Step on the sidelines and wait for the new trend to emerge or wait for this trend to resume to the upside with some nice bullish movement. One candle does not a reversal make. So keep that in mind, regardless, even though at times like this, everybody is going to be screaming for the world to collapse under the weight of its own largesse and inefficiencies. And that's just not the way things work. We wait for confirmation and we are patient as traders. That is how we get the reward. That is why we eat the cheese at the end of the maze while others are 
just air, nothing there. Having said that, I hope you guys have a fantastic day. Leave me any questions down below. Uh, it is April 30th, so the next time I see you is going to be May, and that's tomorrow. We'll be back at 12 p.m. Central Standard Time, guys. Trade safely.